Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is August 31, 1980, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 57. On an August morning 35 years ago, the world we live in suddenly was changed forever. The day was August 6, 1945. It began shortly after dawn that summer morning in southwest Japan. Japanese Defense Forces detected a single American bomber approaching at high altitude. It was heading for the city of Hiroshima. Sirens began to wail and Radio Hiroshima told residents to take cover. The American bomber, a B-29, was droning along six miles high, out of reach of Japanese fighters and flak. It flew directly over the city and on out of sight. A few minutes later it reappeared, flying back over Hiroshima in the opposite direction. Then it was gone. As the all-clear signal sounded in Hiroshima, it seemed like just another false alarm, like other false alarms before it. There were many people in Hiroshima who believed that a real attack would never come to that city. There were all kinds of rumors that America would spare Hiroshima for one reason or another. Among other things, there was a large Christian community in Hiroshima. Even the mayor of Hiroshima was a Christian. There were those who were convinced that America was being merciful to Hiroshima for that reason. But less than an hour after the first all-clear signal on that sunny August morning, Radio Hiroshima started to broadcast another air raid alert. Three more American B-29s were passing over the city, but before the announcer could finish his words, he and 80,000 of his listeners ceased to exist. They were consumed by a man-made sun in the middle of the city which boiled upward into a giant mushroom cloud. Afterward the United States War Department called it a cosmic bomb, quote, unquote. Outside the zone of total destruction, Hiroshima was transformed instantly into a nightmare beyond imagination. The streets were filled with pathetic victims whom the Japanese referred to as the Walking Dead. These were people who had been scorched, irradiated, and dismembered beyond hope, but who would take hours, days, or weeks to die. Men, women, and children staggered around in agony without comprehension of what had happened to them. Many had sockets without eyes and bones without flesh in the aftermath of the unearthly heat wave from the bomb. Countless others have been poisoned by radiation from the blast or the fallout afterward. Within three months 50,000 more people died in Hiroshima. Three days later it all happened again at Nagasaki. Like Hiroshima, Nagasaki had led a charmed life free from American air attack, and as in Hiroshima there were those in Nagasaki who had thought this was an act of mercy by the United States because Nagasaki was not only a Christian center, but the very place where Christianity had got its start in Japan. But all the illusions evaporated in nuclear fireball on August 9, 1945. Today America is haunted by the quarter-million ghosts of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thirty-five years ago our country became the first in history to use atomic warfare, and today it is fast becoming our turn. Our Satanic leaders are trying to make us forget the human hell of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Instead, they're trying to make nuclear war more thinkable to us. They want to close our eyes to the reality of nuclear war, because that is the only way in which they can trick us into accepting it. The legacy of America's war against Japan in World War II is also returning to haunt us in another way. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was brought about deliberately in order to get America into the war, and now the Bolsheviks here are turning all of America into a nuclear Pearl Harbor, and for the same purpose. Today we are all on the front lines. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I revealed the plan by which the Bolsheviks here intend to provoke a Russian nuclear attack. It involves a deliberate false alert and the use of our secretly deployed Minuteman TX mobile missile. If the Bolsheviks here succeed in carrying out the plan, 
the United States as we now know it will cease to exist. Pearl Harbor, USA will die in a thousand Hiroshima's, but the Satanic Bolsheviks here who now control our government will use our sacrifice for their own personal benefit. My friends, these are the things that lie ahead for us unless we the people take action to prevent it. Under our Constitution this is both our right and our duty. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, America's Nuclear First Strike Plans in the News, Topic No. 2, Hurricane Allen and Russia's Expanding Weather Warfare, and Topic No. 3, Step 2 in What You Can Do. Topic No. 1. Thirty-five years ago this month the age of nuclear warfare exploded into history at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was unleashed by the United States in a deliberate display of sheer mass destruction and stark terror. What America did to those two Japanese cities became the basis of America's entire doctrine of nuclear strategy. The basic concept was that America would never shoot first in a nuclear war. Instead, we would hold the specter of Hiroshima and Nagasaki over the head of any would-be attacker. America's nuclear arsenal was aimed at Russian cities. Any Russian attack on the United States would have caused cities all across Russia to vanish quickly in nuclear fireballs. Knowing that, supposedly the Russians would never attack us. But early this month on August 5 a drastic change in America's nuclear war strategy was made public. For the very first time ever the United States is officially adopting what is called a counter-force nuclear strategy. It has been made official by a document called Presidential Directive 59. The Directive states that America's prime nuclear targets will no longer be Russian cities. Instead, the prime targets will now be Russia's military forces and political leadership. This change in America's nuclear doctrine is so radical that it is provoking widespread controversy, especially overseas. Spokesmen here are trying to give it a sugar coating so that we the people will swallow it easily. The official excuse for the new strategy is that it is intended to limit and deter nuclear war, and yet the same directive demands preparations to fight a prolonged nuclear war not just hours, but weeks or months. So what does all this really mean? My friends, to see the answer you don't have to be a military expert. All you have to do is to use plain old common sense. For example, listen to some words from a letter to the editor published in the New York Times just a few days ago on August 24. Referring to the new American plan to attack Russian military installation, the writer says, quote, does that mean that while they destroy us in the cities, our commanders in their shelters would then destroy their military installations? Unless this is a charade to substantiate the production of more missiles, it must mean that the United States is preparing to start a nuclear war with a first strike." Unquote. It is signed Kenneth Boss, Brooklyn. Those few words of simple logic contain more truth than you will ever hear in the official excuses from Washington. Over two years ago, in AUDIO LETTER No. 36 for July 1978, I first revealed America's secret shift to a first strike strategy. At the time not many people would believe me, but now we are drawing closer and closer to nuclear war itself day by day, and as we do so, the first strike strategy of the United States is coming to the surface. Last February 21, 1980, there was the statement of Defense Department spokesman Thomas Ross. He shocked reporters by saying that America might shoot first, quote unquote, in a nuclear war. And now there is Presidential Directive 59. By proclaiming America's shift to a counter-force strategy, it further confirms the secret intentions to launch a nuclear first strike at Russia. And my friends, there is more. 
The drastic changes in America's military posture during the past two years have coincided with a hidden change in leadership of our country. The Satanic Bolsheviks, who have been overthrown and expelled from Russia, have seized control of America's government. Now they are dragging us down the road toward a war which will be nuclear suicide for you and me. But as I explained last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 56, our Bolshevik rulers do not expect to suffer and die like the rest of us. Instead, they plan to take full advantage of their first strike plan for their own benefit. Last month I said, quote, because they will know when war is about to start, they will be able to protect themselves. They plan to use their positions of governmental power to hide in government war bunkers throughout the United States." Unquote. Less than two weeks after I recorded those words in AUDIO LETTER No. 56, Presidential Directive 58 was leaked to the press on August 11. In the words of the New York Times the following day, quote, President Carter has ordered more effective procedures for protecting civilian and military leaders in event of nuclear war, including plans for the rapid evacuation of key government personnel from Washington to airborne and underground command posts." Unquote. My friends, the Directive is concerned with maintaining what is called the continuity of government, their government only. You and I and our children are left to fend for ourselves. Last month I explained that the Bolsheviks here are possessed by only one all-consuming goal. That goal is to mount a nuclear offense against Russia that will set off Nuclear War I. They don't care how badly the United States is beaten so long as they can wound Russia with at least 20 million dead. With that attitude, matters of a defensive nature are of no interest to the Bolsheviks here. Likewise, tactical weapons which cannot be used to attack Russia are being given very little attention. A creeping paralysis is slowly crippling America's armed forces, and our secret Bolshevik rulers could not care less. Examples of this are all around us. For example, consider the plight of the Air Force's Premier Fighter Group at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. It's the first tactical fighter wing with a tradition of leadership that stretches back to the First World War. They fly America's hottest new Air Force fighter, the F-15, and their motto is, Readiness is our profession. But earlier this summer, on June 7, the first tactical fighter wing failed an Air Force readiness test. Of the 66 F-15s on hand, barely one-third were in condition to be put to use for missions. There simply are not enough spare parts or skilled maintenance personnel to go around, and elsewhere the picture is no brighter. For example, we often hear about America's supposed increased commitment to NATO, but readiness of the United States Air Force in Europe mirrors the situation I just mentioned at Langley. Funding to pay for flight operations and maintenance has been reduced, not increased. Instead, the Bolsheviks here are siphoning off every dollar to focus on secret preparations in their first strike plan. Meanwhile, Air Force units in Europe are hampered by inadequate spare parts, fewer flight operations, and declining proficiency of pilots as a result. The story is much the same among the other services. There has been heavy publicity over the past year or two about the problems of the Army, including the lack of spare parts and skilled maintenance. But the Navy is also in the same fix, especially in certain areas of naval aviation. The declining readiness of our non-strategic forces is a direct result of our Bolshevik rulers' preoccupation with nuclear war preparations. Another sign of this is the never-ending rash of brush fires around Russia's perimeter. In AUDIO LETTER No. 53 last January I described how Russia's intervention in Afghanistan was triggered by extensive CIA activity in that country, and to this day large amounts of aid are being funneled to the rebels in Afghanistan by the CIA by way of Pakistan and China, 
As a result, Russia's involvement there has been extended far longer than intended, distracting Russia's leaders and siphoning off resources. In Southeast Asia, the United States is pouring arms into Thailand, which is stiffening its stance against Russia's client state, Vietnam. Red China is receiving secret shipments of nuclear weapons from America, and just this month Russia's western flank has been shaken by the crisis over major strikes in Poland. As of now, the Polish regime seems to have succeeded in defusing the bomb of possible revolution to the surprise of CIA-supported labor unions. They were hoping to provoke Russian intervention making Poland a second Afghanistan, but Russia's new rulers have outmaneuvered the old Bolsheviks here. These are some of the many threads which the Bolsheviks are trying to use to tie down the Russian bear. They want to keep the Kremlin off balance and preoccupied while they prepare to set off Nuclear War I. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I described a major program in the latest Bolshevik plans for an American nuclear first strike, the Minuteman TX missile. The Minuteman TX, also known as the Traveling Minuteman, is America's real mobile ICBM. Behind the smoke screen of controversy over the so-called MX mobile missile, Minuteman TX missiles are already being deployed. The Bolsheviks here intend to use them in connection with an elaborate false nuclear alert to set off Nuclear War One, and they are in a hurry. They can't wait ten years to build all those so-called MX launching bases out west. Instead, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 55, the Minuteman TX system is being assembled fast. It borrows heavily from existing hardware of all kinds, and is being deployed along existing railroad tracks in our northern states. Barely two weeks after I gave the details in AUDIO LETTER No. 55, you may have noticed other hints about it in the news. During NBC Nightly News on Television for July 14, 1980, there was a brief segment in which retired General John Singlob made some remarks. He took issue with the MX missile scheme which we keep hearing about. Instead, he said that the United States could regain superiority over Russia quickly within two or three years and what he proposed in place of the MX was what he termed a quick-fix mobile ICBM which would not need the elaborate MX bases out west. General Singlob's words that evening would have fit the Minuteman TX except for one thing. The TX is not two or three years away. It is being deployed right now. The Bolshevik maneuvers to throw America into nuclear war are complex and constantly changing, and yet there is one ingredient that continues to figure in every plan. That ingredient is Iran. I first made public the crucial importance of Iran for an American first strike at Russia two years ago this month in AUDIO LETTER No. 37. The particular strategy of attack which I outlined in that tape has already been attempted this past January 1980 and it ended in failure. But Iran continues to offer very tempting geographic advantages for any attack against Russia, and so one way or another Iran has so far been included in every Bolshevik first strike plan against Russia that has been devised. The Bolsheviks here know very well that they are working against tremendous odds militarily. For nearly three years since late 1977 Russia has been in complete control of the military uses of space, and Russia's cosmostrategic umbrella is designed to make nuclear war difficult to start and impossible to win for any enemy. But our Bolshevik leaders here are determined to have their nuclear war one way or another, and because their plan is a suicide plan for the United States as a whole, they don't care very much how they do it. So they are embarked on a series of plans, one after another, to set off a nuclear first strike against Russia. They intend to just keep it up until something works. But the Russians are just as determined to thwart each war plan as it is attempted, because in this way they are gradually pulling the fangs of the Bolshevik Dragon. 
Even so, the Kremlin leaders are convinced that at some point the Bolsheviks will succeed in setting off nuclear war. Our rulers here have been operating on roughly a three-month cycle in their first strike planning. That is, every three months or so they set a new plan in motion. Each plan is different from the one before, but they all have the same final objective. That objective is an American nuclear first strike followed by all-out war with Russia. The first attempt at an American first strike took place late last January 1980, as I reported in AUDIO LETTERS 53 and 54. That attempt was based on an updated version of the plan which I made public two years ago in AUDIO LETTER 37. There was no public hint about what was afoot other than a rapid buildup of nuclear war talk in the news. Russia succeeded in totally shattering the attack inflicting severe losses on the United States in the process, and here in the United States the nuclear war talk suddenly went away. Next came the so-called hostage rescue mission into Iran in late April. I discussed that in AUDIO LETTER No. 55, so we'll not repeat it here. It was another total defeat for the United States, and that time it could not be hidden completely. The third Bolshevik war plan was to begin with a supposed coup an assassination attempt on Ayatollah Khomeini in late July last month. The real Ayatollah Khomeini was already assassinated long ago, last February 1980, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 54, but that didn't matter for the purposes of the Bolshevik war plan. Part of the plan called for intense fighting at the United States Embassy in Tehran, supposedly in a new hostage rescue attempt, but the game plan called for that to fail in a way that would have aroused American passions and set the stage for military action. In the July plan, Russian intelligence agents were able to stop it before it even started. On July 7, Russia sent a warning to certain members of the Iranian Government about the plan for a coup. Three days later, or on July 10, Iranian authorities announced that they had foiled a major coup attempt. For several weeks thereafter the aftermath of the attempted coup was a story that grew larger and larger in Iran. Before it ran its course, over 600 people were implicated, including several high military officers. All kinds of details were published and broadcast about alleged financing and control from the United States, and some of the plans involving our hostages were exposed. United States Bolshevik agents on the scene wanted to make sure that all of this made no impression on us here in the United States, and so they arranged a diversionary action. On July 10 the first announcement was made in Iran about the halted plot for a coup, but most Americans paid far more attention to another announcement which was made only a few hours later. We were told that one of the hostages, Richard Queen, was about to be released. We were told that this was a humanitarian gesture due to his illness, but that was not the reason for the timing of Queen's release. He had been ill for some time. The exact timing of his surprise release was a CIA ploy. It was solely to draw our attention away from the other major developments going on inside Iran. The fourth Bolshevik war plan was scheduled for this October 1980 but that plan too may have been ruined before it could start. Two weeks ago columnist Jack Anderson tried to publish a series of articles about the October plan. The White House reacted with the usual angry denials, and many major newspapers refused to carry the columns he had written about it. In effect, he was censored by our Bolshevik Government. But my friends, Jack Anderson was basically right in what he wrote. Plans are being laid for an American invasion of Iran, beginning on a limited scale. Jack Anderson's only major mistake is his speculation that politics lies behind the attack plan. The real motivation is much bigger than that, not politics, but nuclear war. Through every avenue possible, our leaders here are drumming up American support for their war preparations. To do that, they are tapping our pride and can-do spirit 
by raising false hopes about our military power. And a perfect example of this is the publicity which began suddenly about ten days ago concerning our so-called stealth plane. We're told that it's a new type airplane that is virtually invisible to Russian radar, and so it would be able to sneak undetected into Russia in order to attack targets there. The Government announcement on August 20 about our so-called stealth craft has led to confused reactions by many people. On one hand, people are encouraged to hear that we have such a remarkable secret weapon to defend ourselves against Russia, but at the same time many people are wondering, if it's so secret, why is the Government suddenly talking about it? My friends, the Government is releasing information about the stealth craft because they know it no longer matters. They found out early this year that it is of no use against Russia. The public statements about the stealth craft have mentioned the fact that it has an unusual shape with rounded surfaces that can help evade radar, but they have not mentioned that the unusual shape has another purpose. That purpose is to enable the craft to perform properly when it is traveling underwater instead of in the air. The stealth craft, my friends, is also known by another name. It is a submersible aircraft, also known as a subcraft. The Government has just announced that it has been tested secretly for the past two years, but I made it public two years ago this month in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 because I believed you had a right to know. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I described how subcraft were to be used in America's first strike against Russia, triggering nuclear war. And last January 1980, in AUDIO LETTER No. 53, I described what happened when our leaders here tried to carry out that plan. The subcraft can evade radar, infrared detection, and other conventional means of sensing, but they are sitting ducks for Russia's master secret weapon which I revealed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. That weapon is Psychoenergetic Range Finding, or PRF, which cannot be evaded or jammed by any known technique. Last January the squadrons of American subcraft with Israeli pilots which tried to attack Russia were tracked by PRF. Russian Cosmospheres armed with charged particle beam weapons positioned themselves overhead. And when the order came for the Cosmospheres to begin firing, the subcraft all disappeared in blinding columns of fire and steam. And so the Bolsheviks here know better than to try to use subcraft or stealth craft, if you prefer, against Russia again. They are useless. As a result, they now have only one real value left, and that is propaganda value against you and me. They want us to believe the lie that we are militarily superior to Russia. They are determined to drag us all over the cliff of nuclear suicide. My friends, we are all on the front lines of Nuclear War One. Topic No. 2 When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 56 last month, I referred to Russia's expanding campaign of weather warfare against the United States. I first revealed that this was beginning last February 1980 in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. As I explained then, Russia's weather warfare is in retaliation for America's giant grain embargo against Russia. The embargo and other boycott techniques used lately by the United States against Russia have been imposed by the Satanic Bolsheviks who now control America's policies. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 54 last February, I gave details of a major Russian breakthrough in weather control. It's a technique by which major storm systems can be created artificially at sea. Then the storms can be guided to specific target areas, and the technique enables rain to be either withheld or released in torrents at will. I gave details about this new Russian weather control technique in the final portion of AUDIO LETTER No. 54. That is the portion 
which had to be released as an emergency transcript because of my heart attack. I was convinced that it was an urgent matter for you to know about this new threat of weather control, and sure enough, during the six months since then, Russia has used this new technique to make drastic changes in our weather, but to judge from my mail, some of my listeners do not seem to have read the transcript carefully. That may have been due to their own immediate worry over my serious illness at that time. I don't know. In any case, I believe a few moments of review are in order, because weather warfare is leading toward food shortages as well as other problems, and you cannot protect yourself unless you understand why America's weather is going crazy. I cannot repeat everything I tried to tell you last February, but let me just remind you of some important points. One is that the first test of Russia's new artificial storm technique took place last October 22, 1979, over the South Atlantic. It began with a mammoth double flash, which was spotted by accident by an old American Vela satellite. When word began to leak out about it, the Bolsheviks here in the government launched a disinformation campaign to confuse everyone. They began by announcing the false date of September 22, and for a while they stirred up falsified accounts that it had been a South African or Israeli A-bomb test. Meanwhile, White House and other special study groups were created supposedly to try to figure it out. Last month in mid-July, the conclusions of the White House group, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Naval Research Laboratory were made public, and they all disagree. Some say it had to be a nuclear blast, others that it could not have been, and the public remains in the dark. But in the emergency transcript portion of AUDIO LETTER No. 54 last February, I told you what the double flash really was. It was created by a twin particle beam blast from Russian weapons on the moon. It was exactly the same double flash phenomenon that I first reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 for December 1977. The result was what I reported to you last February. To use the same words that I used then, quote, tremendous quantities of seawater in the target zone flashed instantly into superheated steam. The hot water vapor and surrounding hot air started rising fast toward the stratosphere. Cooler air started racing into the target zone to fill the vacuum. The inward rushing winds began to swirl due to the Earth's rotation, and the barometric pressure began dropping in the target zone. Within minutes the atmosphere above the target zone was a spiraling chimney of tumbling, rising air and water vapor. The world's first totally man-made storm cell was being born over the South Atlantic." Unquote. I then continued with details about the methods used by the groups of Cosmospheres in order to control the storm cell from that point onward. I described how electron beams are used in order to keep the water vapor airborne instead of forming into rain. This basic technique has been used in order to interfere with natural cloud production this summer in the United States. The result has been an extended drought and killer heat wave over much of our country, and now the food shortages which I tried to warn you about six months ago are beginning to cast their shadow. America's spring wheat and corn crops have suffered major reductions, and other crops have suffered too. The effects are already beginning to show up in higher prices at your supermarket, and now the specter of water shortage is growing worse by the day in some areas. But the most dramatic Russian weather war attack so far began just a few days after I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 56 last month, and it made use of the very techniques I detailed last February, scaled up and intensified. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 56 on July 30, I referred to Russia's expanding weather warfare. 
and I gave a warning that, quote, Next, my friends, we must brace ourselves for hurricanes unlike anything ever seen before in America." Unquote. As I said those words, Russian weather control weapons were at work in the Atlantic Ocean east of the Caribbean. Taking advantage of favorable conditions, they were setting off Tropical Storm Allen, the first of the season. Four days later, August 3, it began creeping into the news. It had just grown into Hurricane Allen and was growing fast. That night it pounded across the island of Barbados with 125-mile winds. Then it changed course just in time for the center to miss St. Lucia. Even so, eight people lay dead as it pounded off into the Caribbean. By August 5, Hurricane Allen was making headlines as the Hurricane of the Century, quote unquote. As it made its way across the open waters of the Caribbean, it was already packing 160-mile winds and still growing. By the next day it was rated a Category 5 hurricane, the worst there is. Peak winds were 170 miles per hour, and Puerto Rico, 250 miles away, was receiving gusts up to 70 miles per hour. Hurricane Allen was a killer hurricane rated the most dangerous ever to strike the Eastern Caribbean, but for the first several days most forecasters in the United States were confident that there was no threat to our own coastline. It looked like it was heading for southern Mexico or Central America, but in fact Russian Cosmospheres were steering the storm. They were shooting for the narrow gap between Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba's west coast. Up to that point, the hurricane's path through the Caribbean was chosen for the least contact possible with land for two reasons. For one thing, the Russians wanted to minimize the number of unintended victims and damage, but even more, they wanted to conserve maximum force in the hurricane for the ultimate target, our own Gulf Coast. This is why Hurricane Allen kept mystifying weather forecasters with its unexpected twists and turns. The only place in the Caribbean where Hurricane Allen swerved toward major land masses uh, was in the vicinity of southeastern Cuba. The hurricane's eye had been heading straight for Jamaica, but at the last minute it turned and went between Jamaica and southwest Haiti. It pounded our naval base at Guantanamo Bay in southeast Cuba and then moved further out to sea again. It bruised the tip of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula but avoided populated areas. Then it entered the Gulf of Mexico. Building up again, the hurricane of the century headed for the South Texas coast. The killer storm, with nearly 100 dead in its wake, headed straight for Brownsville. But the Russians were not interested in Brownsville, and they halted the storm while the center was still more than 90 miles offshore. Once again America's weather forecasters watched with mouths agape as another prediction fell apart. Hurricane Allen ignored Brownsville and started northward. Up to this point the Russian attack plan using Hurricane Allen was right on track, but from this point onward it started falling apart. The Russians were hoping to strike three targets along the Gulf Coast with the same hurricane. The intended targets were the Houston-Galveston area, then New Orleans, and finally Mobile, Alabama. This was to be done by keeping the eye of the hurricane at sea. The Cosmospheres were to guide the hurricane along the coast to the Houston area, then inward towards land to do as much damage as possible. Then they were instructed to pull the hurricane back out to sea to rebuild it before it could collapse over land. With its power rebuilt, the plan was to move on to New Orleans, repeat the process, and so on. But Hurricane Allen was by far the largest storm system which the Russian weather warriors have attempted to control, and when they turned the storm northward at Brownsville they started miscalculating. They were trying to make Hurricane Allen go against very powerful natural forces, and they tried to do it too fast. 
Cosmospheres over the Gulf of Mexico generated proton clouds in the atmosphere at three points. These points were south of Houston and south and east of the Louisiana coast. As I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 54, proton clouds are used to steer a storm system, but this time the Russians made a bad miscalculation in spacing their proton clouds. The storm did start northward toward Houston as planned, and on the way did some damage to Corpus Christi, Texas, but the greatest effect of the proton clouds was not as planned. They badly disrupted the circulation of winds around the hurricane. As a result, the whole storm rapidly fell apart. Thanks to the Russian miscalculation, the killer hurricane of the century, Hurricane Allen, ended in anticlimax. But my friends, the Russian weather warriors have learned from this mistake just as they have learned from past mistakes. Artificial storms, rainstorms, hurricanes, or blizzards are now a powerful weapon in Russia's arsenal, and the kamikaze war plans of our own Bolshevik rulers are causing these weather weapons to be used against you and me. Topic No. 3 Last month I reported to you that more and more people are asking me, what can I do? I responded by giving you Step 1 of my answer. As I told you then, it is only the very first step. Many more will have to follow if there is to be any hope for our country. The old adage is still true that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and my friends, we have a very long way to go. I said last month that I would have more to say about what we can do on one condition. That condition depended on you. I said that I would tell you more if and only if I received evidence that many of you are taking action, and I'm glad to report that up to now many of you are responding wholeheartedly in this campaign to try to save our land. For that reason I'm about to tell you what we can and we must do next because I emphasize again we will accomplish absolutely nothing unless we stick with it. We have to embark on a campaign in which we refuse to be defeated, and it has to be a campaign that grows bigger and stronger day by day, week by week. Numbers count. Every single one of you counts. You count, and so do your neighbors and friends. The stakes are nothing less than freedom and survival itself. I cannot in good conscience raise any false hopes about what we are doing. We have already waited far too long for there to be any guarantee of success, but if we do not act we will guarantee failure. Knowing that there is action which you can take, you cannot avoid making a decision about what to do about it. If you just put it off or can't make up your mind, that is a decision not to act, and if you decide not to act, then you are casting your vote against America. If you do not act, you are voting for economic disaster, for Satanic Bolshevik dictatorship, and for America's destruction in Nuclear War I, because those are the things which are almost upon us. Unless we the people do our constitutional duty to stop it. But if you are joining those who are taking action, then you are casting your vote for America by demanding the truth about our nation's gold reserves. You are voting for economic survival, for freedom, and for prevention of nuclear war. I believe that the time has come for all of us to do what is right simply because it is right. Last month I explained that our campaign to save America must begin with our economy. Specifically, we must begin by bringing about a truthful accounting of what has happened to our country's monetary gold reserves, because the most basic of all our economic woes is our collapsing dollar, and it is collapsing because Contrary to official Treasury statements, our gold is gone. 
Only a few small dregs of highly impure gold are left. It's like the so-called gold medallions which went on sale by the United States Government on July 15. These medallions are much lower in gold content than the advertising leads one to believe, and to make matters even worse, many of the medallions were botched during the alloying process. As a result, there is less gold near the rim than there is in the center of the medallion. Even the natives in the bush in Africa know that if the money is corrupt, the government is corrupt. If we want to survive economically, politically, and militarily, we must clean out the corruption in our land, and the starting point to do that is to get back our gold reserves and so return to an honest dollar. Last month in Step 1 about what you can do. I urge each one of you to write to Senator William Proxmire of Wisconsin. I suggested that you urge him to open up a full public investigation of the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. As a starting point, I refer to the giant secret shipment of gold which left Fort Knox on January 20, 1965, the very day Lyndon Johnson was inaugurated President. Many of you have sent me copies of the letters you have sent to Senator Proxmire since hearing my tape last month, so I'm now going to outline my suggestions for Step 2 in what you can do. We must continue to concentrate on Senator Proxmire, but we need to do other things too. If you have not yet taken Step 1, which I outlined last month, please do it now. Join with the rest of us in this campaign. We cannot stand still, my friends. Either we go forward or we fall backward and fail. Step 2 in what you can do can be divided into three parts. Each one is something which is well within your power to do, and each one is important. First I want to give you access to more information which you can use as your ammunition in this battle. Second, I want to suggest that you use this information in follow-up correspondence with Senator Proxmire. And third, I want to point out how you can use the same information to start spreading the word to other people you know. Let me begin with a matter of additional information about our gold reserves. This is printed material which you can use both to educate yourself and to alert your friends. First, my friend Mr. Edward Durrell has published two pamphlets which I would recommend as a starting point. One is titled, 52 Unanswered Questions Regarding Alleged Gold Reserves of the United States. The other is the transcript of a speech by Mr. Durrell titled, How the United States Lost Its Gold Reserves. Both pamphlets give many facts, figures, names, and dates. Mr. Durrell has agreed to make available a supply of these two pamphlets for distribution without charge from my National Headquarters here in Washington. Anyone in the United States may obtain these two pamphlets by sending a large self-addressed envelope bearing proper postage to my office. Be sure to send a business size No. 10 envelope, not something smaller, and apply 28 cents postage. It will also speed things up if you will mark your envelope with the word Pamphlets in the lower left corner. Send it to me, Dr. Beter. Suite 5092, 1629 K Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. 2006. My listeners outside the United States may receive the pair of pamphlets by sending your name and address plus $2 to cover air mail postage and handling. There is also another place where you may now obtain additional information, and that is from a Congressman. Dr. Ron Paul of Texas. On July 30, 1980, the day I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 56, Congressman Paul rose to speak in Congress. His purpose was to introduce a bill designated H.R. 7874, the Monetary Freedom Act. The bill contains eight separate titles, but the first is the most important of all. Here is how Congressman Paul explained it before the House of Representatives, and I now quote, Title I requires the Secretary of the Treasury to perform a full assay 
inventory and audit of the gold reserves of the United States. This thorough study is to be completed within six months of the passage of the bill and double-checked by the General Accounting Office. The results of the study are to be sent to Congress so that the representatives of the people will learn for the first time in almost 30 years the true status of our gold reserves. The Congress will in turn release the information to the American people. Although present law requires an annual inventory of our gold reserves, the law is not being complied with, and only a small portion of the reserves are audited each year. As any businessman knows, that is no way to conduct an inventory, and this bill would correct that deficiency. Such a complete audit, inventory, and assay would lay to rest the persistent rumors that gold is missing from our national stockpile and that the gold we have is of inferior quality." End of quotation from Congressman Paul's remarks. My friends, by introducing the Monetary Freedom Act, Congressman Dr. Ron Paul has displayed courage that is rare indeed in Congress today. I strongly suggest that you write to Congressman Paul and request a copy of his bill, H.R. 7874, and while you are at it, be sure to express your appreciation and support for his efforts. The address is Representative Ron Paul, P.A.U.L., House Office Building, Washington, D.C. It will cost you only a few minutes' time and a few cents in postage to obtain your copies of the Monetary Freedom Act and Mr. Durrell's pamphlets, and for that small price you will be rewarded with information that is powerful ammunition for you to use. The next question is, how do you use it? The answer is that knowledge like this will be useful to you again and again, but for now I suggest that you make use of these materials in two ways. One is for follow-up in your correspondence with Senator Proxmire. The other is in spreading the word among your friends and neighbors. In your follow-up with Senator Proxmire, it's time to write him again now whether or not he answered you last month. If he has answered you, by all means express your appreciation and take account of whatever he said. But as I warned you last month, beware of attempts to just brush you off which are standard practice here in Washington today. Up to now, not one of the many people who have reported writing to Proxmire has reported receiving a reply from him. If that is the case with you, let him know that ignoring you will not make you go away. In any case, I suggest that you call Senator Proxmire's attention to the bill just introduced in the House of Representatives by Congressman Paul. You might ask him why it takes a junior Congressman to ask for the truth about our gold reserves instead of Proxmire, the champion of the Golden Fleece Award. Urge him to contact his counterpart in the House, Congressman Henry Royce, R.E.U.S.S., -S, Chairman of the House Banking Committee. Both Proxmire and Royce are from Wisconsin, so why should they not talk to one another? urge Senator Proxmire to take the lead in a joint Congressional investigation. Once you have written your follow-up letter to Senator Proxmire, I urge you to start sharing all this with your friends and neighbors. They're not likely to hear one word about it in the news, so I suggest that you begin by showing them Congressman Paul's Monetary Freedom Act. Call their attention to what he said about the gold inventory law not being complied with for nearly 30 years regarding our gold reserves. Once they realize that this is a matter which has been put before Congress, they are likely to be more receptive to learning more about our plight. Of course, you will find that many people will just close their eyes. But for those who are interested, show them what is at stake in the gold scandal, that is, our economic survival. And if you can, 
Ask them to write to Senator Proxmire too. They don't have to be convinced that our gold is gone. All that matters is that they agree that we the people have a right to know, to learn the truth. My friends, I have suggested guidelines for three things you can do as parts of Step 2 in what you can do. First, arm yourself with more information. Second, follow up with Senator Proxmire. Third, start spreading the word to others. It may sound like a lot listening to it all at once, but just take it at one step at a time, at your own pace. Just do one thing at a time, but keep at it. That's what matters. Ultimately our goal is very simple. Either gold is there or it is not there, and so the Fort Knox Bullion Depository will have to be opened up once again. It must be an honest inspection, unlike the carefully staged peep show of September 1974. It must include the crucial Central Core Vault, whose existence was never mentioned to the September 1974 visitors. That presents a problem, my friends, because the Central Core Vault is contaminated with Plutonium-239, as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 5, but somehow it must be done, because if it is not done we will continue down the path to thermonuclear war. It is now time to give you my last-minute summary. Suffice it to say that we are drawing closer and closer to Nuclear War One. All-out war between the United States and Russia will be set off by the United States by means of a first strike. The closer we come to war itself, the closer these things are coming to the surface in the news. Only this month this was reflected in two major policy announcements by the United States. One is America's unprecedented shift to a counterforce nuclear strategy against Russia, a first-strike nuclear posture, and along with that policy is its twin brother calling for better protection of certain governmental leaders in case of war. Our Bolshevik rulers are preparing to protect themselves while they sacrifice us on the altar of Satanic power. I've tried to urge you to see for yourselves where we are heading, to stop and think of the true consequences of following our leaders into war, and to offer you some alternatives, some things that you can do yourself in an effort to turn the tide before disaster strikes. There's no guarantee of success if we do act, my friends, but if we do not act, there is a guarantee that our country will die soon in Nuclear War One. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.